It's time for Voice of Indy. Your hosts today are Beam Weeks, author, producer, and marketing monster for independent multimedia publisher Fresh Ink Group, and Stephen G's, author, producer, composer, and publisher for Fresh Ink Group. Greetings and happy Wednesday, everybody. It's time for another episode of the Voice of Indy podcast. Uh, this is episode number 170. I am your host, Bean Weeks, and with me is Mr. Stephen G. How are you doing tonight, Stephen? I'm freezing. It's 30-something degrees down here in Alabama. We're not used to this, but the frogs are all hiding under some warm places, and they're not out there tonight. So uh, I'm just sitting here just excited about our guest tonight and having a fun podcast well, fantastic. We got 35 degrees up here in Michigan right now, and uh, the, it's supposed to dip. We got up this morning. There was a, like a light dusting of snow on the roof in the, the driveway. So it's that time of year. What are you going to do? So sometime in the next couple of days here, I'm going to be sending out a blast uh, email to all of the Fresh Ink Group authors that we publish, alerting them that we have now officially, in the last couple of days, raised the prices on all of the books that we publish, except for the ones we've published in the last six weeks or so, because we have to increase the wholesale discount to 40%. Uh, that's a requirement, not an option. On the other hand, that's going to make uh, print-on-demand books a lot more attractive to bricks and mortar stores, so they say, but we'll see how that goes. But if you have published your books with us, you might want to get out there to places like Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and see. You will notice that your books have gone up a dollar or two, maybe three, and in a few cases, four dollars uh, on the cover price in order to cover the new wholesale discount and ensure that our authors make a nice, healthy royalty off of every book sale. So look for that email, but in the meantime, uh, go out there and check it out, see what your new prices are, and that's what we have to work with from now on. On the other hand, if there's a price change that you don't like, get with us. We can adjust that. Uh, we just had to make judgment calls, and we had to do it for 240-something titles. So that was a major job that took three weeks, and uh, we're happy that that's done now. So that's the new way of doing things, 40% wholesale discounts to retailers. All right. Well, yeah, that uh, was a bit of work there uh, facilitating that little change there, but uh, we're done. Uh, okay, uh, listeners, uh, Village Boss, uh, a excellent thriller, military, uh, globe-hopping uh, novel by first-time author Ronan Duval that is now available in wide circulation everywhere. It's uh, in bookstores across the globe, so get out there and grab a copy. It's a good book. Uh, I've read it, and uh, if you're into uh, uh, armed uh, drug dealers, going out against the government and mind control subjects and the CIA and all kinds of interesting things like that. Mercenaries for hire, this is your butt. Uh, so uh, check it out. Village Boss by Ronan Duval. And uh, listeners, we have a number that you can call and you can be part of tonight's episode. And uh, you can also do that through uh, Twitter. So here's how you can participate in the show tonight. Call 516-453-9902 right now with your questions or comments for tonight's guest. Or post a note on Twitter with hashtag Fresh Ink Group in the body of the tweet and we'll read it on air. That's 516-453-9902 or hashtag Fresh Ink Group on Twitter. All right. All right. I'm hearing, so a, I'm hearing a low hit. Kind of a... Uh, 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 just like a little static I can't tell. Could be an internet uh, thing. So we have an announcement to make. Our guest last week, Zeta Alfaro, has been invited to become a member of the Fresh Ink Group. This is something we do about once or twice a year when we come across somebody that we do not publish. Now, when we publish uh, somebody, whether it be audio books, print books, e-books, uh, whatever, whatever it is we do for you, then we tend to make you a, a member of Fresh Ink Group. Uh, in the case of Zeta, we do not publish her. She's an indie musician who produces her own records. She's an indie author who writes and produces her own books. So, 
we we were impressed with her. We liked everything about her. We liked her work, and she was out there supporting us. Once she became a guest on the podcast, she followed all our social media, boosted our posts, helped promote the podcast, and basically became a team player very fast. And uh, so we invited Zeta. She graciously accepted our offer. You can now find her at freshaintgroup.com on the members page, and you can click on her at her page and, and go in there and see her records and her books and what she's up to and whatnot. So that's Zeta Alfaro, new Fresh Ink Group member. Welcome, Zeta. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, she was a lot of fun on the show last week. So uh, And she really connected with a lot of our listeners, uh, as we've heard from them. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, go over there and check out her page. Now, somebody we do publish is when I'm playing out. Her book, The Gift, is out now. Uh, it's part of an eight- uh, uh, book series uh, from the uh, the ladies at uh, Story Empire, and uh, you can uh, grab a copy of that at Amazon. And uh, if you want to know about these these books that we're talking about here and what's coming up uh, down the road for Fresh Ink Group, who we're publishing, and what's coming up, and who's going to be on this this podcast each week, we've got a newsletter. And if you're not subscribed to it, what's wrong with you? Get subscribed to it. Here's how you can subscribe to that newsletter. Stay on top of these podcasts and all things Fresh Ink Group with our weekly digital newsletter. New releases, videos, stories, excerpts, interviews, and more. Sign up now on the homepage of FreshInkGroup.com and be the one who knows what's what. What? All right. Uh, so let's take a quick look at the top 25 print bestsellers from Fresh Ink Group. See what's going on out there in the retail business book industry. At the 25 slot, we've got How to Teach Driving, Behind the Wheel, Lesson by Lesson by Kenneth Lindquist. This is the Instructor's Edition. He's also got a Parent's Edition to help parents uh, teach their teens how to be good, safe drivers. The Instructor's Edition is for people who want to become certified instructors in driver's education. And, you know, state by state, different regions, uh, those requirements vary, so he tries to cover it all. Uh, that's How to Teach Driving by Kenneth Lindquist. Above that, we've got David Carroll. David Carroll's the NBC Evening Newscaster in Chattanooga, and it's his book, Volunteer Bama Dog. Uh, we've not seen this one on the list in a little while. This is uh, a take where he takes a look at what goes on in, in the South and culture and, and things like that. He does Southernisms, uh, and he just has a lot of fun with it. That's Volunteer Bama Dog. Volunteer refers to Tennessee, Bama to Alabama, and dog. Georgia Bulldogs, so it's a look at these three states and the people who live there from a, a man who's been the media mogul in their area his whole career. Above that, Robert G. Willis Cross, Operation Icebreaker, a Mac McDowell mission. It's one of the four Mac McDowell missions that's out right now, and uh, it doesn't matter what order you read them in, check them out, Operation Icebreaker. Into Autumn, a story of survival by Larry Landgraf. That's one of his four dystopian novels about a post-apocalyptic future. Government breaks down and people have to band together and form their own little societies and learn to survive. Above that, The Chair, Volume 2. This one's Volume 2 of The Chair by Robert McKenzie. Volume 3 is the current one. I suspect we might see that a little bit higher on the list. The Adventures of Ali Orangutan. This is an illustrated chapter book also by Larry Landgraf, who wrote that dystopian novel series uh, that I just mentioned a minute ago. This is a story about an orangutan who's being shipped to a zoo in America, and he escapes and goes on an adventure. Above that, another Mac McDowell mission. This is the first one in the series, Operation Ivy Bells by Robert G. Willis Croft. Submarine Cold War Thriller. A great series. Get in there and check it. American Agony, The Opioid War Against Patients in Pain by Dr. Helen Burrell. Look at the politics behind opioid enforcement. Village Boss, new to the list by Ronan Duvall. Village Boss, the hardcover edition. That's pretty cool for a new novel that's only been out for a couple of days. He's doing real well in the hardcovers. Above that, The Rise and Fall of a Construction Giant, The History, People, and Stories of CFW Construction by Dick Ferrer, Jr., that's a company founded by his father and a friend and became a huge construction company, covered seven states and multiple countries, and then eventually crashed and burned amid scandals and and uh, plane crash that killed executives and other things like that. So check that out by Dick Ferrer, Jr. We published that book 
seven, eight years ago, and it is still making our bestseller list. Above that, A.K. Wingler's How to Start and Run Your Own Food Truck Business in Georgia. She's also got Florida and Tennessee books out there for starting a food truck business as well. Now, above that, we've got the hardcover edition of Celebrate 98, the untold stories behind the Tennessee Football Balls 1998 National Championship, and that is by tonight's guest, Dave Hooker of Off the Hook Sports. Above that, B.A. Johnson's got the next two books, Sassy Uncovers Peter Allen's Secret, and above that, Sassy Discovers the AME Church. Those are the two books so far in her Sassy series, where young Sassy learns about her church. We're right now working on B.A. Johnson's Pandemonium and Puzzle Town, which is not a Sassy book. She's branching out. Above that, we've got Shipwrecked and Rescued, The City of Banger by Larry Jorgensen. That's the story of those several hundred old Chryslers in the 1920s being shipped up to Canada, never made it there. What happened? And Did they get those cars back? Did they rescue the crew? It's all told with pictures and interviews and behind-the-scenes stories in Larry Jorgensen's uh, historical account. Now, our contract's going to be running out on this book in about a month, and we will be unpublishing it. So if this is intriguing you, get your copy now while you can, because this book is going to be unavailable pretty soon. A.K. Wingler's How to Start and Run Your Own Food Truck Business in Florida is next up. And then above that, the paperback edition of Ellen Burrell's American Agony about the opioid war. Now, above that, The High Road, Memories from a Long Trip by old friend Mark Herndon, Country Music Hall of Fame drummer, played with the supergroup Alabama for almost three decades. Mark tells the story about what it's like to be famous and travel the world and play to sold-out arenas, but also... Get caught up in some personal scandals and issues with the band and whatnot. He tells the whole story, takes responsibility for his own mistakes, and takes the high road. It's a great, great book for people who are interested in music, fans of Alabama, fans of Mark Herndon, uh, and people who just like to read about that kind of life and see see what's, what goes on behind the scenes. Mark, was, uh, Mark is also a uh, private pilot. He's a commercial airline pilot, so when Alabama was on tour, Mark was the guy flying the plane quite often, and boy, there's a cool adventure about that as well. You're going to want to read the book. Now, this gets us to our top five. Shipwrecked and Rescued, The City of Bangor, about those old Chrysler's paperback edition is number five. Number four, Meet William Shakespeare, a superbly entertaining one-person play starring the bard himself by J. Ash Looney. J.S. Looney went to a Renaissance Fair about a month ago and was really promoting this book heavily. And it is still writing number four right now, so the book's doing very well. Number three, David Carroll, NBC newscaster, I Won't Be Your Escape Goat, David Carroll's homemade social media blunders. That's a, that's a funny, funny book. It's just hilarious. Check it yes, out. It is. Now, top two. <laughs> Celebrate 98, the untold stories behind the Tennessee Football Vols 1998 National Championship by tonight's guest, Dave Hooker. Paperback edition is our number two print bestseller this week. Now, that brings us to what's number one. Well, we got a book here that wasn't even on the top 25 list last week. This week, it's shot up to number one. So, I think the author's been out there talking it up. It's called Submariner. 30 Years of Hijinks and Keeping the Fleet Afloat by retired U.S. Navy Lieutenant Commander Jerry Pate. That's the paperback edition. 60 chapters of behind the scenes, above and below the water, living the life and having the crazy stories to tell. Check that book out, Submariner, 30 Years of Hijinks and Keeping the Fleet Afloat. Congratulations to everybody who made our top 25 list. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, and uh, some of the we got some new books coming out here uh, over the next couple of weeks uh, that will probably be cracking that top 25 in uh, the upcoming show. Uh, the upcoming releases, uh, The Soul Whisperer's Decision by Gwen M. Plano. American Darkness by Stephen Skibicki. Uh, American Darkness is a book of uh, some really cool poems, poetry, uh, but it's got some uh, short stories in there as well. Stephen, Stephen is a, a solid, uh, solid writer, uh, especially with the poetry. It's dark. It's it's very visual. So check that out when it comes out. Uh, and then the essence of spiritual awakening by Judy White Arts. I've got it on uh, good authority that she's Judy and not Judith. <laughs> 
uh, Robert G. Willis Cross Star Child Saga series uh, and uh, ran the third fourth chronicle by Robert G. Willis Cross will also be out soon. So uh, keep the, your ears and eyes peeled and open and uh, get get uh, signed up for that newsletter. You'll you'll be on top of all that stuff. Uh, in the meantime, if you've missed an episode or if there's a, a favorite guest that we had on here that you want to go back and revisit, uh, we have an archive, and here's how you can find that. Find your favorite show in the Voice of Indie archive on YouTube at Fresh Ink Group, StephenG's.com, BeamWeeks.com, FreshInkGroup.com, and on Spotify. And now you can listen on iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, and tune in. Just search The Voice of Indy, all one word. Dave Hooker here, longtime Tennessee sports writer, and I know that true Tennessee fans are celebrating the 25th anniversary of the legendary 1998 Tennessee Volunteers Championship season. I'll tell you what, you celebrate 98, I try to bring the full color photos and detail of the transfer of power from Peyton Manning to Al Wilson. The preparation to win the first BCS National Championship, the locker room dynamics, and the challenges of a team rising above deep tragedy. Key plays include an interception, a fumble maybe against Arkansas, and a bit of trickeration. Also, there's that Florida game. I analyze the leadership, the strategies, and the players' commitment to each other and share what we are still learning from this team even today. Discover what happened to those heroes of the gridiron and where they are now. Proudly published by the Fresh Ink Group, Celebrate 98 is available in all the digital forms, but you can also get your own soft cover or jacketed hardcover keepsake edition from booksellers worldwide. Want an autographed edition? Go to offthehooksports.com. That's offthehooksports.com, and I'll personalize it for you. Celebrate 98 is a collector's item and a cherished gift that belongs to all fans of college football and the Tennessee Volunteers. And speaking of Dave Hooker, let's meet tonight's guest, Dave Hooker. He has covered Tennessee football for over 25 years. The award-winning writer and talk show host has worked for various media outlets, including ESPN, the flagship station of the Ball Network, and appeared on multiple national platforms as a college football analyst. A Powell High School graduate, Dave graduated from the University of Tennessee in 1998. Boy, that's a cool year, huh? Which happened to be a pretty good year for the Vols. He has two children, and he resides in East Tennessee. Welcome to the show, Dave. Welcome, Dave. Hey, thanks, thanks, th- thanks for having me on. I greatly appreciate it. All right. So, all right. So uh, we know. Go ahead. No, that's all right. I think we're going to ask the same know, question. Yeah, we know that you're Powell graduate and you live in East Tennessee. You all always been from Tennessee. If you lived elsewhere, you moved around. What's what's the story about your whereabouts? Um, uh, native East Tennessean. Um. You know, it was one of those things where I grew up in Knoxville and Powell, just north of Knoxville. And, um, you know, I, there was always uh, a University of Tennessee tie. My uh, uh, high school football coach at the, the school I went to, Powell High School, uh, actually, uh, uh, Clark Duncan, played football for uh, the University of Tennessee. A um, couple of players went through Powell High School to the University of Tennessee. So, you know, I, it's funny. I got my kids now, and we look at different schools and we evaluate them. And there was no question I was going to the University of Tennessee, so uh, that's where I went. I've lived in East Tennessee uh, uh, my entire life. Um, so yeah, I know that uh, kind of native East Tennessean for sure. Hmm. Now, with the writing of this this book, we'll we'll get to the book here in a little bit. Uh, as a as in, in childhood, were you a reader? Did you like to read and write a lot, or did you just uh, play a lot of sports and then the writing came later? Uh, I love reading. I love reading periodicals. Uh, I'll I'll be honest with you. Um, sometimes I'll get half. I'm halfway through a Bo Jackson book right now that I really like. Um, um, I, I so I do love reading. Um, I have a voracious appetite for reading, but um, you know, as far as checking books off the list, 
Um, I know a lot of people can do that and then go through uh, a ton of books. Um, as far as sports, um, I played baseball uh, and was uh, an uh, umpire and referee and official for a number of years and uh, before uh, I went to the University of Tennessee. And then it was um, basically I started out and didn't think you could make uh, any money in the media biz, which I guess that's uh, still debatable. But I um, uh, just studied business initially. And then after a couple of years of being miserable, I decided that I was going to do what I wanted to do. And uh, no matter the you know long-term financial outcome, turns out things have gone great. And I've enjoyed a, a, a very entertaining career, to say the least. Did you play sports as a kid too? Yeah, that's what he just said. No, I play, yeah, yeah, I played baseball. Um, uh, I mean, other I stuff. A, yeah, well, I mean, I was kind of a backyard warrior, uh, so to speak. Uh, some coaches may have uh, said I have a, a tendency to not follow rules. So, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I um, I was always around sports and. Um, uh, playing sports in the backyard. My best friends were uh, always athletes for whatever reason. I, I don't know why that is, but I do think for whatever reason, that was probably just happenstance that some of my best friends happened to be on a, a pretty legendary football team there at Powell that went to the state title loss to uh, Brentwood Academy. But uh, I think that I saw some of the stories and the relationships and the intermeshing when you talk about such a large group of people striving for one goal. I mean, that's bigger than the biggest family when you think about 85 scholarship players and, and everything that's going on. And um, I, I think I, I, I appreciated that through those relationships. And then I felt, for whatever reason, fell in love with the, the sport of football and kind of the X's and O's of it to the point that uh, I, could, I could bore you with that. But I, more than anything, I think I recognize the relationships within a team. I think that every single person uh, has a story and probably has a compelling one. And uh, that turned out to be what I really enjoyed doing and still to this day is is telling those compelling stories because I, I believe that sports doesn't build character, which we've heard said so many times. I think it reveals character like that. And, oh yeah yeah and i i think that um you know not to just jump to pub in the book but with the 98 team they had a lot of character and they had a lot of toughness and um they had a lot of discipline and uh you know I, I, me included if we all lived our lives as as disciplined as those guys when it came to football we, we uh we'd be a, a pretty successful group that's for sure so you, you mentioned that you have two kids. Are they old enough to be University of Tennessee students yet? No. Well, oh, well, they, they're old enough, yes. But um, you know, they actually, uh, my son uh, is studying film at UMass, Ooh. and uh, my daughter does go to UT. She goes uh, to UT Chattanooga. So uh, they, did, they didn't follow me in the orange, which, you know, really if you think about it, um, Saturdays, for a lot of people, when it comes to football, that was tailgating and going out, with, going to the game, going out with your friends, partying. Well, that was a really serious work day for me, riding on deadline. So I didn't do a lot of the social things that you would you would think of that come with football. And I I, I have no regrets about that. I enjoyed uh, studying the game, but they weren't. I don't think necessarily raised around that nearly as much as as you might think. So um, uh, they're they're not the the biggest sports fans in the world. My my son does love the NBA, played lacrosse in high school, um, which is Native American for very expensive. In case you're wondering, that's what lacrosse <laughs> <Yeah>. means. <laughs> um, but but um, it, you know, so um, they're they're not big sports fans. My wife's not a big sports fan either. She's a great proofreader. Uh, Gary, I think you you probably yes, didn't have to catch some mistakes because of yes, because is. of her. Um, and also, uh, yeah, I had some great proofreaders. My mom, a good friend of mine, Stacy, and uh, there's a lot of people that 
that proved that. So hopefully it was uh, somewhat clean when it got to you. But um, you know, no, really, it was it was more of a work day for me, and I, I clocked in and enjoyed definitely enjoyed my profession, no doubt about it. Cool. Uh, right. We're talking to Dave Hooker of Off the Hook Sports, author of Celebrate 98 about the championship Tennessee Vols team. And we're taking calls. If you want to call in, 516-453-9902. Or we'll see you over on Twitter with hashtag Fresh Ink Group. We've got a couple of commercials now. In the heart of the Bible Belt, only one thing could drive folks to set aside the good Lord's commandment to love thy neighbor. One of the state's longest and most combative high school football rivalries. Located about 25 miles west of Chattanooga, hard by the Alabama state line, and in an area with more pride than prosperity, the level of football achievements at Marion County in South Pittsburgh, separated by just eight miles, has fueled the rivalry's intensity for nearly a century. South Pittsburgh is the only school in the state that has played for a state championship in all six decades that Tennessee has held a playoff system. While Marion County once reeled off a streak of 56-1 and that included four state titles in six years. Having seen every game since the mid-1970s, first as a student at South Pittsburgh, then as a Chattanooga sports writer since 1990, Stephen Hargis brings a unique perspective to Tennessee's most quarrelsome prep football rivalry. He brings every title run to life with a mixture of history, humor, and nearly 200 color photos. He takes you right into the locker rooms as coaches prepare for each big game and onto the sidelines to hear the trash talking between players. Steven brings to life the ultra-competitive characters on both sides as he weaves the heartfelt personal stories of coaches, players, and supporters from the community who give the colorful rivalry so much of its energy. Proximity and pride are what energize the atmosphere of the games. Published by Fresh Ink Group, eight hateful miles can be yours now as a keepsake dust jacket and hardcover trade paperback and all ebooks worldwide. Familiarity truly does breed contempt across eight hateful miles. I'm David Carroll, and I'm proud of my recent books, Chattanooga Radio and Television, Volunteer Bama Dog, and Hello Chattanooga, famous people who have visited the Tennessee Valley. Like many folks, I spend too much time on social media, but I put that time to good use. For years, I've been collecting social media misspellings, misinterpretations, and other mishaps from tweets, text messages, even the signs you see at stores and on the highways. I've collected the funniest foul-ups in my latest book, I Won't Be Your Escape Goat, David Carroll's homemade, homemade social media blunders. I top them off with my own snarky comments, and they're illustrated by a talented artist, my friend Mike Salter. There are a lot of laugh-out-loud moments in the book, more than 400 of them. We all make mistakes, and sure, you can blame it on spell check, but maybe, just maybe, we didn't pay enough attention in English class. Either way, this book will bring a smile to your face or to the face of someone you love. We can all agree what the world needs now is laughter, and lots of it. I Won't Be Your Escape Goat, proudly published by Fresh Ink Group, in softcover, jacketed hardcover, and all ebook formats. That is a funny, funny book there. Yeah, we're talking to Dave Hooker of Off the Hook Sports and author of Celebrate 98, about the championship, 1998 championship Tennessee balls. So, Dave... Uh, you spent a lot of your time following sports, writing about sports, and whatever. Do you have any other odd, strange hobbies, collecting orchids, building ant farms, or, or anything like that that you use to get away from sports and just uh, uh, pass the time? Uh, I love, I, I do love lifting weights. Um, I, I enjoy uh, resistance training, if that's what you want to call it. Um, but you'll never find me on an elliptical. So <laughs> I, I, I walk in the gym and like half of it, half of it could just fall off the face of the earth and the other half I enjoy. So uh, I do enjoy that. And um, I, I love documentaries in, in general, learning about uh, something that um, I'm interested in um, or sometimes not interested in. Sometimes the funny ones are really good. So I'm a big documentary guy. Um so you know, uh, you know how we can all fall down that that YouTube 
hole where suddenly we're watching something uh, with Theo Vaughn on it that we never dreamed we'd watch. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a big documentary guy, and uh, I used to play racquetball quite a bit, but uh, I got a hip that doesn't like playing racquetball nearly as much as I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, how did you get into the sports writing? Okay, you you like to read and play sports as a kid, but what got you into actually the sports angle of writing as opposed to, say, you know, writing the news? Oh, I know I know that, I, well, A, I, I love sports, and in particular football. You know, if I, it, I don't know what it would have been like if I wasn't raised in the southeast where football was kind of king because, you know, if you're if you're in California, football is not the the biggest sport necessarily, and there's not that that passion for it. But other than liking it, I did absolutely know beyond the shadow of a doubt that I didn't want to be covering a car accident at 3 a.m. with a terrible tragedy of, about it, uh, and I didn't want to uh, cover court cases that can be either boring or sometimes in, in some cases that I've seen court reporters go through, um, very traumatic even for the uh, observers. So I knew that I didn't want to do anything in the real world. Uh, I knew that <laughs> sports was the avenue that uh, I wanted to choose. And while there, you know, there are great stories there, um, who, you know, whoever, whoever wins the national championship, good for them. Whoever loses the national championship, uh, they're they're still gonna, you know, every, all things considered, wake up the next day and the sun's gonna come up. So uh, that was that was natural for me. And then again, the the, the love of dissecting the X's and O's of football, which I really enjoy more than probably most of, of my peers. I think we all have our particularly favorite things. And and um, I, I I I've loved the um, I love the art of the interview. So I can't remember if we started with um, why I went in that direction, but you know, it used to be players would come out and you would be able to interview 20 players. And nowadays it's so antiseptic and it's just um, there'll be maybe three or four players a day and they only talk for eight minutes and you don't get any follow-up questions. So, yeah, I don't know if I would have been in love with this profession when I came out, uh, if I came out now as opposed to then. Because, you know, having a sincere conversation with somebody to me is is a good thing. Yeah, well, everything that I've noticed about your writing is you, you make the effort to get to know the player, find out what his motives are, what he's thinking, and, you know, what's what's the not-so-obvious stuff that's going to affect his performance and his game and stuff. And that's reflected heavily in this book, which I, I really appreciate, too. Uh, is that is that uh, easy, easy for thank you? Thank you. That I means you, a lot. Do you have good rapport with, with players, or do you find that they vary quite a bit? Some don't want to talk to you. Some you can't get them to shut up. You know, how, how does that work? Um, well, I think the more successful you get in general, the less you want to talk to the media. So if you get the 16-year-old uh, kid who's going into his junior year and he just picks up his first scholarship to Tennessee – uh, then he's going to want to talk to you like crazy, right? And if you get Aaron Rodgers, who's going from the Packers to the New York Jets, he doesn't want to talk to anybody except for Pat McAfee on his broadcast. So I think those are opposite ends of the spectrum. Most people fall somewhere in between. Some people are incredibly uncomfortable being interviewed, and I have felt empathy for them at the time. Some people like talking, um, and some people – it's just talking. I think those are probably the best ones. And I can remember athletes that would just talk to you. They didn't have um, some sort of agenda at play. Uh, they just they just talked to you. And um, I really appreciated that throughout the years and the guys that did that and that didn't try to go coach speak. You know, we got next game's coming up. We're going to do the best we can. And this is going to do this. And, you know, it, it, we get a lot of coach speak nowadays. And, uh, I miss that part of it, and I think the long form interview, uh, whether it's sports or not, is is coming back into uh, 
in in the fashion, and I'm excited about that and the potential about that and interviewing some um, people for longer than just uh, just typical uh, 10 to 12 minute radio type of interviews. So uh, that's some things we've got planned off the hook sports, but I, I you know I would enjoy interviewing. Um, you know, Elon Musk every bit as much as Jerry Jones um, when it when it comes to conversation and, and not talking politics, but just getting to know somebody that's uber successful in their field, I, I find very entertaining. Hmm. Well, when did you get the idea to do this book? Where did the idea come from, and how did that kind of come together? Well, well I guess it was about five years ago, and it was the 20th anniversary, and uh, I – interviewed a lot of players for that. And then um, I actually got out of the uh, communications field for a couple of years and worked in digital marketing until I realized once again what I think that my wife knew and everybody else around me knew, that I would I would eventually miss journalism and the aspect of communications that I enjoy. So uh, I got back into it. I launched my own website off the sports.com, uh, and then I um, – and then we have a, a live streaming show every day, and we get to interview players, and we get to do a lot of different things that I don't think are being done some someplace. So um, I, I can't remember your question exactly, Gary. What, what was your question about how I got? Oh, how I got to the book. Yeah. So as I'm doing all this, there's there's free time, you know, because I you know quit my other job, and so there's free time, and I'm like, well, I've done some of these interviews. Let's do some more, and. Um, you know, we wanted to have the book in earlier in the summer, but we waited on a Dion Grant. But, man, what a great interview he was about that interception at Florida that uh, put Tennessee in position to be number one in the nation. And um, so, yeah, I, I started thinking about the book, I guess, early 2023 and was determined to, to tackle it in December. And that's when we when we started. And then. Finally, we got it done. It looks fantastic. You guys did a, a great job of putting it together. And my wife said it feels like we've had a baby. And I said, it feels like we've got a baby I never want to see again because it's so much work. <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah, um, I, I think that uh, probably about a year and a half, almost two years, I decided that I was going to write it. Yeah, you know, you're talking about a lot of work went into it. Uh, you've got a lot of uh, really cool pictures in it, and you've got uh, some of these where are the where are they now kind of uh, stories. How did you do the research on that, and uh, how did you come up with a lot of these photos that are in there? Well, a lot of the photos we, we purchased through various outlets. Uh, some were available uh, from the University of Tennessee. Um, not not really as many as you would think. Some were available from uh, the SEC, and then we also bought some on a freelance basis. But, you know, really you think about it, 25 years, you, that that is – it's not easy to get great pictures because of the lighting and all the factors that have to go into it. And you have to press the button at the right time. It's not like pulling a still from a video. And it's not like today where – if there's 80,000 fans at a sporting event, then there are 80,000 phones. So yeah. that part of it, that part of it, honestly, was harder than I thought it would be. Um, I didn't foresee that. That that was more difficult. And I, you know, lean on Gary for advice and and ask around. And in the end, we got some we got some pretty cool photos to go with it. All right, we're talking to Dave Booker of Off the Hook Sports and author of Celebrate 98 about the championship Tennessee Falls from 1998. And if you want to call in, 516-453-9902, and we're going to take a commercial break. What drives a man to spend 26 years performing night after night? To persevere through a stifling tour bus, bad food, strange women, flared tempers, a plane nearly blown from the sky. Just how did that troubled military brat with a dream claw his way from dirt floor dive bar shows to the world's biggest stages? Aviator, author, and country music Hall of Fame drummer Mark Herndon lived that dream playing with Alabama, one of the most popular and celebrated bands of all time. 
He learned some hard lessons about people and life, the music industry, the accolades and awards, how easy it is to lose it all, and how hard it is to survive, to embrace sobriety, to live even one more day. Herndon's poignant memoir offers a tale at once cautionary and inspirational, delightful and heartbreaking, funny yet deeply personal. From innocence to rebellion to acceptance, can a man still flourish when the spotlight dims? Are true forgiveness, redemption, and serenity even possible when the powerful say everything you achieved somehow doesn't even count? That you're not who you and everyone who matters thought you were? Find all this and more in Mark's remarkable memoir, The High Road, Memories from a Long Trip. Proudly published by Fresh Ink Group in paperback and ebooks, and now in the keepsake dust-jacketed hardcover edition demanded by true fans. Mark Herndon refuses to slow down. So look back, look ahead, and join him on the trip. He's taking the high road. All right, notice our commercials are spending some time in the South today. The first one, Celebrate 98, is by tonight's guest, Dave Booker, sports writer Dave Booker. The next one was Eight Hateful Miles by Tennessee sports writer Stephen Argus. The next one, I won't... Uh, I Won't Be Your Escape Boat, Goat by Tennessee news anchor David Carroll. But then the high road, we moved down to Alabama because Mark Herndon is down here near Fort Payne, Alabama, not too far from where I am. And we've got one coming up tonight, too, CFW Construction, which is Fayetteville, Tennessee. So we're spending some time in the South today hanging with Dave Hooker, sports writer. You having fun so far, Dave? I am. It's a good time. How about you? Oh, yeah. Uh, college football is like the one sport that I follow. You know, I'm from Michigan, so it's Michigan Wolverines. That's where my degrees are from, too. And we're having a good year this year. Tennessee, not a bad year. Not a bad year. Not 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 as well as some of us had hoped. But uh, what do you think? What do you think of how things are shaping up so far this year in college football, Dave? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting. I, I think Michigan and Georgia, and I guess Georgia's a spot edge or the. Uh, two best teams on the eye test, but if you start going by resume, you see with the the college football playoff, they they shuffled some teams around. So I guess it's if it's whether or not you want to go by resume or you want to go by just eye test. To me, Michigan looks like they're right there with Georgia. I would take Georgia with a very slight edge. Um, I find it interesting that the entire SEC is down except for Georgia. I mean, when's the last time? Nick Saban searching for a quarterback in September in Alabama. I mean, that just doesn't happen. Tennessee no, lost a no. lot as well. No, yeah, he's done a lot Florida. of pacing on the sideline this year, hasn't he? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, and I think you know, I think Jalen Milrow may be their answer, but um it took a while to get there. And then, you know, Florida struggling, LSU not as good as a lot of the thought. And so I think it's I think it's wide open this year. And I think the future of college football um, is 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 incredibly bright, just incredibly bright. Right now, it's the NFL and everybody else, including college football, is fighting for the number two seat at the table. But I'm not so sure that that'll be the case in five years. If you look at television trends for the NFL, they've come down. As for football, they're skyrocketing. Um, so I, I could see a time, and I thought there was a time at one point where NASCAR and the NFL were pretty close together um, since NASCAR's kind of ruined itself. But I think we could see a time where um, college football and the NFL are pulling the same type of ratings. I think college football with the 12-team playoff is on a trajectory way, way up. Yes, yeah, Definitely. Yeah, another thing about this year, too, Clemson surprised me. Clemson just plummeted. Usually they're up there as one of the contenders, but it just didn't work for them this year. Yeah, and there's a tie, there's kind of a tie to Tennessee there. Uh, Clemson probably won their two national titles because Tennessee went through a decade of dysfunction, as fellow author Mark Nagy called it, and, and, he, um, and Tennessee was so bad that Clemson not only kept the players in their state that Tennessee had been getting back in that 98 season, but they also took some players from East Tennessee. And then, of course, uh, Tennessee and Clemson played 
in the Rose Bowl. And one other tie with Clemson, I think Tennessee fans want former Clemson defensive coordinator Brent Venables to, even though they lost last week, to do uh, continue to do well at Oklahoma because that's where Josh Heupel was the offensive coordinator and quarterback. So you don't want Oklahoma to come calling. I think there are a lot of bitter feelings there and the way things yeah. ended. So it would take an administration change. But, yeah, there's there's a lot of Tennessee Clemson ties that are out there. But they, they certainly have, have stumbled, and I don't think it ever helps for their head coach to jump on a fan, and um, which which uh, that uh, they they did Davos Sweeney did just recently. That didn't make a lot of sense. To me. No, the, uh, we learned back in the Woody Hayes era that you got to keep your temper under control when you're on the sideline. You're setting the tone for everybody. Yeah. Good old Woody Hayes. Yeah. All right, Good we, old Woody uh, Hayes. We're going to go to a phone call. We've got one of our longtime listeners and supporters of the show, Dr. Helen Burrell on the line. Do- Hello, Dr. Helen. Hi, Helen. Hello, Dr. Helen. Hello, hello. Doctor. Well, well, hopefully she'll call back. We must have dropped her. Well, her number's still up there, so maybe she uh, nodded off. <laughs> I don't know, taking a nap. Uh, well, we tried, Helen. So, uh, But we can take a look here at a couple of tweets on Twitter. Uh, we've got uh, Verwain Greenhall. He says, uh, we were talking about earlier when we were talking about the uh, temperature, he says we're at 43 in the armpit of Florida with an expected low of 37. Yeah, well, he came from... Uh, he came from um, uh, the UP, so 37 is warm for those guys up there. That being the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Yeah, yeah. If you're not from Michigan, the UP is. <laughs> you the don't know what peninsula. UP means, yeah. And, and that's very cold up there. Uh, they've very already got cold. snow up there at this point, so. Yes. All right. Uh, you want to take right. the next one there, Stephen? Yeah, we're talking to Dave Hooker of Off the Hook Sports, and we're talking about his book, Celebrate 98. Now, Dave. I'm looking at chapters here. The transfer of power, replacing a legend, tease time. What what are these about? How's this book get started? What's it, what's how do you get us into this story? Um, well, I, it uh, first I think you have to kind of know a little bit of the backdrop of the '97 to '98 season. So '90, yeah, '97 yeah, was the year that Tennessee was loaded up to win a national title, and they had lost. Uh, several consecutive times to Florida, but they had a guy named Peyton Manning who's gone on to be pretty popular and a good Saturday not live talk show host. And, uh, and he plays quarterback. And so um, he was there for his uh, senior year, which nobody expected because he was supposed to leave after his junior year and be the number one pick in the draft. But he returned because he loved football. Money wasn't an issue for the Manning family. His dad played in the NFL. So he stayed, and uh, Tennessee was absolutely loaded. I mean, there's no question about it. They were loaded in the 97 team. But uh, in, in my opinion, they tried to outpass Steve Spurrier, as they did throughout Peyton Manning's career. So they lost to Florida. And at that point, um, then they lost Peyton Manning for the 98 year. But they also lost an all-pro cornerback in uh, Derry Thayer. They lost. Um, at least 12 really good players. So you're thinking the next year is going to be a rebuilding year. Um, and Tennessee, I think, started the season number 13 in the nation. Nobody expected them to be anywhere close to sniffing for a national championship. And that was one of the special things of, about this group. It was through hard work. It was through grit. Now, I'm not going to tell you that they're overachievers and they weren't incredibly talented. They were incredibly talented. Philip Fulmer had recruited the high level, and they had defensive tackles that were running four six four fives, uh, which is is pretty incredible. Those are the big guys we're talking about. So they were super super talented. But a question at quarterback and a question as far as your offensive direction, uh, I think a lot of people just thought ninety eight would be a season where you try to reload and then go into 99, which would have been the quarterback T. Martin senior year. But they had guys like Al Wilson, and Al Wilson um, took control of that team. Um, They essentially demanded that you be there 
not only for regular workouts, but for essentially practices without pads in the summer. Coaches aren't allowed to hold practices, but you can't keep the players from going out and doing what they want. So they were essentially practicing for a couple of hours a day, Monday through Friday, without pads, full full practices um, from everybody I talked to. So you know, there, there, that, that story of, of toughness as well uh, is, is in there and yeah it was just a really special group so when you when you realize how underrated they were in the beginning uh how they needed a little help along the way uh if you think it made for one of the better uh national championship uh runs in terms of entertainment and and modern era of college football yeah you know uh talking about uh the expectations not being there for 98 before the start of it, that 97, you know, that in sports and in so many other things that that you can have all the talent in the world, but if it doesn't come together, nothing's going to happen. You need to have that chemistry. You need to have those, those moments where things just go your way. Uh, You know, I've witnessed this. I'm up here in Michigan. Uh, I've been a sports junkie my whole life. The last few years, kind of given up on it. We've got crap teams up here. But I watched the Detroit Red Wings. I mean, year after year, man, this, they were the best team in, in, in hockey. They won the President's Trophy for the most wins numerous times, but couldn't get over the hump. They had all this talent and couldn't get over the hump until they bring in a coach who knows how to pull all this stuff together. And it was more than just talent. They got rid of some of their top players and brought in some of these grinders. And it just it's those little things. It takes more than talent. Those things have to come together, and that's what 98 kind of sounds like with Tennessee. Things just kind of fell into place. Yeah, that's probably the best way to put it. Don't ever tell any of the members of the 98 team, well, you got lucky on that such-and-such such play like the Arkansas fumble. No, uh, they'll look at you like you're crazy. There was – yeah. There was, there was, they, they, they don't like a lot. Uh, but there was, a, there was a lot of good fortune that that team had, and um, they took advantage of it. So, uh, big time kudos to them. And uh, no, there was not much expected out of them. You know, Philip Fulmer was trying to motivate him, but motivate them. But he said in the off season during preseason, this is in the book that, um, hey. This is probably a seven-win football team, maybe an eight-win football team. Um, well, they were incredibly insulted by that and went and had one of the, as Philip Fulmer called it, one of the scariest brawls that he had ever seen between the offense and the defense because the, the offense had been getting whipped by the defense uh, because they didn't have Peyton Manning and they were getting used to a new quarterback. So, um, you know, there's those stories of an offense uh, coming along, but – when you look back at that team, if not for the toughness, they probably are a seven-win team, a six-win team. But it was a group that was really bonded. The other cool part I, th- I thought about that group is that, you know, I think we all think that, you know, players uh, have their hands out, get money, get the $100 handshakes. And I'm not saying that never happened. But I do know there were times that, the players all pitched in because the cafeteria closed on Sunday morning and they'd have a cookout and some of the players didn't have any money to chip in. Nowadays you can pay players with NIL. We do that at all folks sports as a matter of fact, but, um, you know, back, back then it was just more of this camaraderie. We got to get through this thing together. And there's the transfer portal now where you can easily leave from one school to another I think we're talking about the type of team, and I'm not saying they're the last team. Uh, there were probably, I'm sure there were some um, that overcame adversity in the 2000s, 2010s. But we're talking about one of the last teams that was was truly more about team than they were a little bit about themselves, and truly dependent on each other to survive and succeed. And if if not for one another. Uh, they they weren't going to make it through, and um, yeah, I don't I don't know that we see that anymore with guys making a significant amount of change uh, just for showing up on campus. You know, there's talk that Tennessee has a quarterback that I uh, got promised eight million dollars to be a college football player for three years. That ain't how these guys were living. I can promise you that. <laughs> 
Now, uh, you've got a chapter, and they're talking about the early challenges uh, that this team faced. Uh, what were some of those early challenges? That you've touched on some of them, but... Uh, yeah, it was it was definitely replacing. Uh, I think Steve Martin. I'm, I'm sorry, replacing Peyton Manning with Steve Martin was the biggest one. And they they knew they needed to go to more of a rushing offense. And I know that he was frustrated that he wasn't allowed to do more in the offense. They just felt like they were a good running football team. So I mean that was one of the challenges. Um, the transfer of power I don't think was that challenging. You know they got whipped by Nebraska in the season before, and they came back ready to practice. Al Wilson was one of the leaders, ready to work out, I should say, hit the weight room. Uh, he was one of the true leaders. So I don't think leadership was an issue, but finding a quarterback uh, definitely was an issue. Um, finding an offensive uh, personality was definitely an issue. Tennessee had a ton of talent on defense. Um, the ability to move guys around, uh, so just finding the right mix there. And then they go into the season, and in the first month of the year, one of the you know, arguably uh, best tailbacks in, in the modern, well, let's not say modern era, let's say past 25 years, uh, Jamal Lewis, who is only one of eight men, I believe, to rush for 2,000 yards in the season, goes down with an ACL injury. Well, I mean, that's September, do you really think that you're going to make a national championship run without your star quarterback who's now in the NFL for the Indianapolis Colts, without your star um, running back who turns out to be one of the most productive players in a single season in the NFL? Um, there was every reason to, to doubt this team along the way. Um, so I, th those were some of the early challenges. But they faced challenges throughout the year because – they were not the type of offense that would just outscore someone and uh, be able to take the last couple of quarters off. Now, that happened at times against lower opponents like Kentucky and Vanderbilt. But for the most part, they had to show up and play. They had to play a Syracuse uh, team led by Donovan McNabb in the first game of the season. And you know, he was a high, strong Heisman candidate. That was a really good football team. So, yeah, it was it was a very, very challenging schedule. Yeah, I remember Donovan, Donovan McNabb. Uh, all right, we are talking with uh, Dave Hooker off the hor off the sport off the sport. <laughs> <laughs> off the I knew you would do it. I knew yeah. you would do it. <laughs> so, uh, and he is also the author of Celebrate '98, and we will be right back after a couple of commercials. Submariner, thirty years of hijinks and keeping the fleet afloat. Jerry Pate's semi-autobiographical collection of 60 stories recounts his 30 years in and around the U.S. Navy submarine fleet, ranging from light-hearted to wrenching. All are poignant inside looks at naval operations rarely seen by outsiders. Topics include the real story behind the shuttle Challenger tragedy, risking his own life underwater, discovering a Soviet spy living across the street, surviving when an engine ignites, critical missions, and the everyday lives of men and women of the fleet. Compiled by author Robert G. Williscroft and proudly published by Fresh Ink Group, Submariner is available worldwide in hardcover, softcover, and all ebook formats. Dive into Submariner for hijinks and breathtaking adventure with this poignant memoir by a true American hero. Determined to bring utilities and small building construction to rural areas, William R. Carter joined with Dick Fair and John Williams to form the CFW Construction Company in Fayetteville, Tennessee in 1952. Named for the partners, CFW expanded into building plants, roads, tunnels, bridges, and more. Within 40 years, the company grew to five offices, 14 subsidiaries, a thousand pieces of equipment, and a proud workforce of more than 1,500 across a dozen states. Then came the scandals. By the end of the 20th century, CFW was gone, and the lives of everybody had changed. Dick Ferrer's son was there for the best and the worst. 
He knows the history and people of Fayetteville, Tennessee, where he lives with his wife not five minutes from where CFW started on Pioneer Street and three minutes from where it ended at 1824 Pulaski Highway. Now, he's written the definitive history, not just about a company, but a region and its people. With nearly a hundred restored photos, most in color, Fair Jr. tells the true story, naming names and documenting the details. Get your copy now and grab extras as gifts in hardcover with dust jacket or maybe a softcover trade edition. It's also available in all the ebook formats worldwide, including Nook, Kindle, Google Play, iTunes, Kobo, and more. The rise and fall of a construction giant is a keepsake, a historical record, the chronicle of an era, a compelling story told by the man at its center at the end. The Rise and Fall of a Construction Giant by Dick Fair Jr. is proudly published by Fresh Ink Group. All right, we are talking with uh, Dave Hooker from Off the Hook Sports. <laughs> Got it that time. Uh, now, uh, Dave, uh, you talked about the uh, the challenges uh, that the team had to overcome. It was a tragedy, too. What was that about? Uh, yeah, so you're, are you referring to the uh, Billy Ratliff and the Brand, Brandon Burlesworth um, play the, the Arkansas Fumble? Or you, oh, 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 you're referring to the Dwayne. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so Dwayne six. Goodrich, I, I believe, is – okay, gotcha. Um so uh, Dwayne Goodrich was one of the star players of the team. There's no question about it. And he was a uh, very, very good cornerback. He was uh, actually drafted. And I guess, that, you know, it's funny you bring this, this story up, and it's one of the first in the book. It's, it's, it's one of the ones that made me really interested in the brotherhood between these young men and now a little bit older men like me. And um, he was drafted in the second round by the Dallas Cowboys. And he was going to replace a guy who you may have heard of, coaches at Colorado, what's his name, rhymes with neon or something. <laughs> yeah. uh, but he was supposed to, yeah, he was supposed to replace Deion Sanders. And um, they're early in his career, um, and he's been open and talked about this. And I would encourage people, if you don't mind me throwing out another plug, if you go to my YouTube channel, Off the Oak Sports, there's a, an interview with him. And Fred White, who I couldn't have done the book without, uh, safety on that team, an uh, incredible man who helped line up a lot of these interviews. And uh, Dwayne Goodrich was involved in an accident leaving a club uh, at about 3 a.m. And a couple of uh, good Samaritans were rendering aid to a person uh, that was on the side of the road in, uh, I believe it was a burning car. And um, Dwayne Goodrich stuck, struck those two people, and uh, they were fatally wounded. Um, also, you can search on YouTube. It has nothing to do with my channel, but a very emotional uh, Dwayne Goodrich apologizing and um, being hugged by uh, one of the uh, uh, family members of one of the deceased. And um, so the first thing you asked Dwayne is, you know, you had this tight brothership with uh, all these other players. How much did they help you get through the eight years in, that you had to serve in prison? Because he did, he, he he turned himself in the next day after after leaving the scene, and he he was uh, sentenced to eight years. And he said, "I didn't talk to any of them. I said I didn't, and said uh, I didn't, no visits at all." And I'm thinking, well, "Wow, what? I mean, this, the first thing you think is that they're mad at him." Uh, and I said, "Well, why did nobody call out? Did they not get a hold of you or you know, isolation? I mean, I don't know." And he said, no. I said, I was so ashamed that I didn't speak to any of them. And I wouldn't let any of them visit me for eight years. And then uh, Dwayne gets out, and I can't imagine being 22 and getting out of prison after eight years. Um, well, what do you do? How do you restart your life? And he was in that phase. I don't know what to do. So he went to Fred White, the person I mentioned earlier, who was so, so integral in getting the book done. And... Um, he went to Fred and said, what do I do? And he, Fred said, first of all, you got a place to sleep. Um, you can stay with me. And second of all, you need to go back to school. And Dwayne Goodrich said, go back to school. I mean, why would I go back to school? And said, well, that's, that's 
the right thing to do. The university will still pay for it, and as they as they do with their former players that that might leave early. And uh, Dwayne Goodrich said, "All right, Fred, I'll go back to school if you go back to school." And they both graduated together. So uh, a terrible, terrible situation. But I think it shows you the bond between two young men who not only were there to console each other during hard times, and and Fred is like anybody else, he's had a hard time too, but they were also there to challenge one another and, you know, kind of say, get off your duff, you know, let's get this thing fixed and let's get it right. And um, that's the way this team is still nowadays. I mean, they know if, if, if if you go to Charlotte and you're on that 98 football team and you don't call the guys that are in Charlotte to stay with them instead of staying in a hotel, you're in trouble. I mean, you, you're not supposed to go to another city where a uh, a former teammate lives or a BFL of all for life, as they call them, and and stay at a hotel. That's just that's just bad form, and uh, that's that's how close they were and still are to this day, 25 years later. Oh, and that that story about the tragedy. Those are the kind of stories that that really bring this book alive, and and that behind the scenes stuff, and really illustrates that camaraderie. Uh, one of my favorite chapters, of course, is the Where Are They Now? I like to see what's been going on after 25 years and how their lives have turned out. And some went on to the NFL, and some went other directions or whatever. We've got some other great chapters here too. Um, the highlights: the fumble and the interception and losing a leader, managing men. How about Chapter 12? Uh, let's make the last question about the book, about Chapter 12, called What I Learned. Give us a little bit of a preview about what you learned doing this project. Um, I learned that um, the best coaches in the world cannot lead a group of men that don't want to be led. And that ultimately leadership, yes, it starts at the top, and you have to set that tone, and all that is true. But um, when when you get to the college level or beyond, certainly the NFL level, you better you better have some internal leadership on, on that roster. And if you don't, um, I, I don't think great success is going to be in front of you. If you do you have the the chance to be really, really special. Uh, the other thing I didn't know, to be quite honest with you, is how incredibly talented they were from top to bottom. Uh, you know, they, they had second-string guys that were standout players in 99 and 2000. In 2001, Travis Stevens was the third-best back on the 98 team. And in 2001, uh, he was one of the leading rushers in, in the SEC. And um, so – just how deep they were and, and, and talented. So, yeah, I learned a lot, but I think I learned about the bond, um, and I, I use that word a lot when I talk about this book, um, between those guys. It's just like it's it's so family-like, but you're talking about 80 people. You know, I think there's a saying that if you have uh, a, a good friend for every finger on one hand, you've lived a good life. I mean, it's it, these guys each have like 80 people, um, yeah. and that that part to me is pretty incredible. Yeah, I can even tell, uh, I can even tell you one time, Gary. This was and Gary, this is funny. You'll appreciate this. There was one player we needed to run down, and I texted Fred and I said, uh, "Hey, Fred, you have such and such his number," and he goes, he just responded, "I've got all my teammates' numbers." Yeah, and I was like, "Okay, may I have?" that number <laughs> yes. but he was almost insulted just for me to imply that he didn't have one of his teammates numbers that's great <laughs> yeah. okay so uh dave the book's been out for a bit uh what are you hearing from fans what what kind of fan reaction are you getting from the book especially amongst those tennessee vowel fans I'm I'm getting a great reaction, but you know if somebody didn't like the book, I don't know if they come up and say, "Hey, man, that was terrible." Um, but no, I mean the the reaction's been great, and I'll be honest with you. I mean, I've done radio, I've, I've written feature stories of, of uh, for ESPN and and papers and, and all that sort of thing, and this was a whole different level of kind of putting yourself out there, so to speak. So 
Um, fortunately, everybody I've heard from has been blown away and very happy with the book, and I'm I'm very blessed because I tell you, when it first came out, and and Gary, when we had that first delivery, I was like, what have I gotten myself into? I'm a nervous uh, wreck. Um, and it and it was not because that we had books to move. It was because that was a little bit of me in each of those those books. So I was I was nervous about that, and I wanted to make sure and portray them the right way. And I've had a couple of players that are uh, reading it, and uh, so far so good. But the last thing I would ever want to do is portray a group that I respect so much, even though there's there's bad stuff in there. Um, that's part of life. Uh, portray them in any negative light. Well, I appreciate the fact that it's written by a true fan. I mean, the, the world is full of sports writers who can pick a topic, pick a team, pick a year, do the research, and then tell that story. But this is a story from somebody who lived and graduated in 98 from Tennessee. I mean, you know, talk about some bona fides, right? And the fact that you're a true fan, you know the team, and that you cared about this, and like you just said, you wanted to portray these people and this story the right way, and that comes through. And all of you out there who are college football fans, that's who you want telling the story, somebody who really knows that team, cares about it, lived it, breathed it, and probably has a streak of orange down down both arms, as far as you know. Uh, and that's, that's cool. I've really enjoyed this book. Now, Dave Hooker, how do people find you out there? How do they follow you? What's your website? Where are you on YouTube? What are your social media handles? Tell us what the 411 is. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, the easiest way is you can go to offthehooksports.com, or it's at the point now you can Google me, and the, our website will show up first. So we provide four or five pieces of fresh analysis-type content, as well as a Monday through Friday streaming show. Also, uh, individual podcasts with current players like Todd and Jacob Warren and Senator Cooper Mays. So as far as the Twitter handle, at the Dave Hooker, and it used to be at the Dave Hooker Show. It's not a pretentious Twitter handle, at the Dave Hooker. Um, so, but I, I took that off, and I couldn't get just Dave Hooker, so that was a mistake. And at OTH, Off the Hook Sports Media, so OTH Sports Media, you can follow us. Uh, i got a great team led by Caleb Calhoun, uh, people that love putting uh, Tennessee and SEC material and content out there on a daily basis and we are completely subscription free that's our business model and we only endorse uh, those sponsors those advertisers that we truly have done business with or would if we needed to and believe in them wholeheartedly so we're going to kind of an old-fashioned business model and we'll, we'll hope it works all right. Well, fantastic. Uh, well, uh, Dave, it looks like uh, Stephen kind of uh, dropped off here, so we're going to wait for him to come back. But, uh, yeah, we appreciate you taking time out of your evening this, this night and uh, introducing yourself to our listeners. So uh, hopefully when this hits the archives, it'll uh, be a big boost, and uh, we'll see some bigger sales for your books as well. So. Yeah, well, it's been great working with you guys. Was that Stephen Hargis that called? No, it's, uh, it's Gary Stephen G's. Uh, he just his. Uh, that's why he, here he is. No, that's not him. But we do have. Oh, yes, it is. He's calling in on the phone. All right, All right you there? All right. Yeah. Apparently, I got All dropped right. out, so I called back in. Yeah, I just saw the thing telling me that you dropped. So, uh, but anyway, I was uh, thanking uh, uh, Dave for uh, taking time out of his day to. Uh, to introduce himself to our listeners. So, yeah, hey, and everybody, well, the, name the, the name of the book yeah, is so Celebrate I wanted, 98. I, I, yeah. <laughs> right. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Celebrate 98, the untold stories behind uh, Tennessee's 1998 National Championship. And I want to thank you guys as well because it was certainly hodgepodge at times of trying to get these last couple of interviews in, especially when I was on vacation. I interviewed Senator Spencer Riley, and he told me that story about the fight that I mentioned, and I had to go add a chapter. Uh, that was in June. We were supposed to be done, I think, in what, – what did Gary we shoot for, uh, April or May? So, yeah, something um, like that. Yeah, you guys – yeah, you guys have been great to work with. So if anybody uh, is is out there considering uh, writing a book, um, I would I would definitely recommend you guys to, to to get it out there, provide some good feedback, and and help put it all together. Because I I don't know anything 
except for stringing sentences together, and some people might say I'm not too great at that. Wow, <laughs> we appreciate that. That was an endorsement from Dave Hooker, who's going to be our guest every week from now on. <laughs> there you go. It's going to be there you go, 8.30 every Wednesday. <laughs> yeah. All right, one last time, people. The book is Celebrate 98, The Untold Stories Behind the Tennessee Football Vols 1998 National Championship by Dave Hooker. And we've appreciated having Dave on the show tonight, and we want you all back next week when we're going to have sci-fi master John B. Rosenman. And week after that, Dean? Week after that, we've got Dana Wayne. We're not uh, real familiar with Dana, but we're going to get to know Dana as you get to know Dana. And after that... yeah. The week after that, the night before Thanksgiving here in the United States. So since a lot of people are traveling and and hitting the road and have plans, holiday plans, we're going to do a rerun of the Patricia A. Guthrie episode we recently did about her Eerie Charms collection of short stories. That's a great episode, so you're going to want to catch that. And then after Thanksgiving? After Thanksgiving, it's Judy White Arts. Uh, and uh, she's uh, got a book coming out and keep your eyes and ears peeled to the newsletter for the, that release date and uh, I've got some other uh, uh, potential guests lined up we've got some that drop us emails all the time saying can we be on your show so I'm going through those and uh, we'll have more uh, um, more to share with you next week so keep uh, listening all right It's been great having Dave Hooker of Off the Hook Sports and his book, Celebrate 98. Thanks again, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, and we'll see everybody next week. We've got a couple of commercials on the way out, and uh, we're looking forward to having you back. Bye, everybody. Bye. A grand epic saga by Robert McKenzie. The Chair Series spans centuries, touching the lives of 22 generations of related mothers and daughters, their stories witnessed by a simple pine chair. Resolute, strong, loving, and fiercely protective, these women must strive to pass their values to new generations in a world of racism and sexism, politics, scandal, fashion, even the rise and dominance of baseball. They live in privilege and poverty with faith and despair, relishing every moment of love, even as they suffer abiding grief. Volume 1, Lightning, Thunder, and Glory, spans the 1600s through World War I, while Volume 2, Faith, Hope, and Love, follows these women's descendants into modern times and beyond. In Volume 3, 7, 8, and 9, the chair flashes back to pre-Civil War America, featuring a woman from the second Mayflower, Her daughter, the black market Irish lace importer, and a Canadian World War I fighter pilot. A blend of history and philosophy told through satire and parody, the story of the chair could be found in some old trunk in any dusty old attic, but Mackenzie breathes it alive with riveting tales that span the real and the imagined. Proudly published by Fresh Ink Group, the Chair Series by Robert McKenzie is available worldwide in jacketed hardcover, softcover, and all ebook editions. In the wake of September 11th, a man who grew up with his mother in Eastern European brothels comes to New York City searching for an adventure, identity, and home. The USA has other plans for him, though. It'll give him what he wants for a price. A series of imposed quests drives our beleaguered hero through America's dark heart, from New York to Boston to a Walmart on the outskirts of Atlanta, where he finds and spreads damnation and salvation while working the night shift. Published worldwide by Fresh Ink Group, grab your copy of Andrew McGregor's How to Paint an American in jacketed hardcover, softcover, and all ebook formats. How to Paint an American. You've been a part of Voice of India, a production of Fresh Ink Group. Spread the word, support our guests, then find us at freshinkgroup.com and be sure to hashtag Fresh Ink Group.